Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to the PMF IS Current Affairs Prelim Test Series. My name is Ashish Malik, and this is your second part of the test number seven that we conducted on 10th of April. And in this particular video, we are going to discuss uh, the second set of questions from 21 to 40. We'll also be guiding you how to approach these kind of questions. But before I begin, I hope this is uh, the high time that everyone must practice as many mcqs as possible because you know upsc prelims is approaching and it's approaching very very closely right so guys make sure that you check out the test series of the pmf ies the link is given in description below and the test series is now available at a very affordable price of 499 with 1000 high quality mcqs so do not miss this chance and check out the test series and practice to boost up your score for the upcoming prelim exam. Starting with the question number 21, the, uh, this question is with respect to a policy, a very, very important policy when it comes to the mining sector of India. The question is about the open acreage licensing policy called OALP. This policy was launched in 2016 and but even today this uh, policy has lots and lots of importance so we need to understand couple of facts about the open acreage pol uh, policy how the mining is done what what changes we have made how the mining was uh, done before 2016 and what changed after 2016 so everything needs to be in your head while attempting this particular kind of question so the very first point is that this open acreage license policy see every thing has a meaning every every word like when it say open acreage it this particular word has a meaning itself how licensing has changed so please understand in india in order to mine the minerals of course we have to take the permission of the government the to make the mining process more simple to make it more competitive and even more profit generating for the government itself the open acreage licensing policy was launched way back in 2016 and this policy was launched under the hydrocarbon exploration and licensing policy called the HELP policy. Star mark on this policy very very important because 2016 uh, prior to that there was a policy called as new exploration licensing policy called NELP. So NELP was a policy that was before 2016. And after 2016, NELP was replaced by HELP. So currently in our country, we have this particular policy when it comes to exploration of the minerals, number one. Number two, here the word open acreage means what? The companies, the private companies, whoever, which, whichever companies, uh, uh, you know, interested in mining part, they can simply put up their expression of interest in any area that they think is best for their mining they can raise this interest to the government they can file their expression of interest and this process can be done throughout the year any part of the year they can go to the government with this expression of interest but such interests are accumulated three times in a year means government uh, take all the expression of interest but it's just the three times government uh, you know actually uh, processes these expression of interest and accordingly according to them uh, accordingly they the government gives the license to these companies that that is done three times in a year please remember like i just told you the help policy replaced the previous nel policy the major change that happened after the help was that this policy shifted to revenue sharing model under the NELP, there was only profit sharing model between the company and the government. But under the HELP, we are not interested in profit sharing because profit sharing comes very late. The government gets the money, gets the share from the very beginning because government is not sharing the profit, it's sharing the revenue. And of course, the revenue part is huge. It's, it's, it's obviously, it's going to be more than the profit share. So government is actually making more money by by going for this kind of policy so right now under the help we are into revenue sharing with the private companies not the profit sharing this is a star mark star point you have to remember plus 
under the health policy like i told you the word open acreage means the freedom to the investors they can choose the blocks of their interest where they want to do the mining now government is not going to tell the companies okay this mining is for auction it's the other way around now the companies have to choose and find the blocks for mineral exploration they have to come out uh, come out come to the government and tell okay this is the area we want to do the mining please give us license so it so that's this this kind of policy is what you call as the open acreage policy plus under the health policy uh, you uh, like if if there is a company who want to explore different kind of hydrocarbons like some companies want to go for conventional hydrocarbons or unconventional ones so earlier there was like for every kind of mineral exploration a uh, different license used to be issued but now under this policy the new policy there is going to be one single uniform licensing system one license is going to cover all kind of hydrocarbons you do not have to go for different licensing for different kind of mining that is one very important thing and that actually makes the thing easy and simple for the companies and that's why under this policy one more point is there is also marketing and pricing freedom which is given to the company of course that is subject to some ceiling price limit but overall the company enjoys marketing and pricing freedom and this all was done in order to ensure better exploration of the minerals in india now if you go back to the question now you have understood the policies very clearly now the only problem the question has with question number 1 because it says the oalp launched under nelp no it is under the hydro exploration licensing policy the it it actually replaced the nelp policy so this statement is wrong you have the answer second and third yeah this is absolutely correct of course uh many people will find the second statement a little bit tough and many people must have had a doubt about the second statement because it talks very specific kind of uh, fact and figure where it specially mentions that this happens three times a year like if you if you read the statement on the first go definitely this statement looks a little bit suspicious and that's where the problem may happen but you can go with the uh, with the elimination technique in this question even if you have this one information that oalp is under the help policy you can simply eliminated the option number 1 that would have given you the answer c as the right answer so in this kind of question you can think first with respect to try to eliminate try to eliminate the option and sometimes the things becomes a cake walk for you so this question was a medium level but could have been attempted very easily by eliminating only one wrong fact which was there so the questions question was medium but options were quite simple for this guys now that takes us to the question number 22 question 22 was a straight forward question with of course there is some doubt in this like the question was with respect to the 1972 shanghai communique the primary focus of this communique was which of the following so please understand shanghai is a city in china okay so make sure that shanghai communique has something to do with china so clearly i can eliminate option number 1 which talks about diplomatic ties of us and ussr of course you you should also eliminate it it cannot be the uh, it cannot be uh, uh, related to the vietnam war or something like that so i can eliminate at least two options now i have a 50 50 chance so my option is going to be either b or d shanghai communique is it about addressing ongoing arms race between us and china no the answer is b 1972 very crucial year for the relations of us and china before 1972 us and china did not have much of the diplomatic ties in fact the diplomatic relationship between the us and china developed after this shanghai communique which normalized the relations and further further made the two countries come closer economically and strategically and you know behind the growth of china it is the hand of us only that actually supported china's growth and that's where uh, india and china today stands quite apart because the way china progressed after 1980s thanks to the us aid and support and help and the market access 
of course that make that made all the difference so this statement is uh, with relation to the option number b is the right answer my question was medium one but i think i could have taken a risk because i am now at a 50 50 risk point so logically if i think because it's in 1972 and please understand 1972 there was no arm race between us and china this is a present day phenomenon 1972 was a time when the two actually started their diplomatic relations so very logically i could have attempted this question with b as my right answer so very logical approach the way i can go for it right so yes so this answer has to be b question number 23 was with respect to the remission now this is about the pardoning power yeah very important guys in our constitution the president and the governor both have their pardoning powers so pardoning powers of the president is under article 72 correct the governor pardoning power is article 161 absolutely correct the pardoning power is also called as the clemency power of the president and the governor but of course there is some difference between the power uh, of course the president power of pardoning is bit broader bit wider this so this statement is correct but why what make the difference i'll explain you a little bit little bit uh, after some time but this particular question has like there are five types of different different pardon where where uh, the five types of pardoning can be done like it it is simply the pardon can be given or commutation can be done uh, you know remission reprieve respite there are there are five different types uh, of the pardoning power which is given what what happens in remission this is interesting and very important so first we'll learn then we'll come back to the question so recently why this so called remission part was in news you should know the context as well you know about the bilkis bano uh, you know case very unfortunate incident that happened in india uh, during the 2002 the gujarat rights now gujarat government recently granted remission to the convicts of the bilkis bano case what is remission and supreme court quashed that remission and now what uh, supreme court ordered every convict which was released earlier uh, than the prescribed time by the state government needs to be in jail again so actually if you look at the remission remission means simply reducing the period of the sentence of a prisoner but without changing its character i mean you can't say okay somebody was given uh, let's say seven years of rigorous imprisonment and you have changed that to a uh, uh, let's say five years normal imprisonment you can't change the character of the punishment if it is a seven year rigorous punishment you can make it five year you can make it four year but it has to be rigorous only so the nature to change about the punishment only the time you can simply reduce the time you can reduce the period of the punishment that is the provision given under the remission but tell let me tell you this power of remission is with both president and governor please understand remission should not be confused with the furlough or parole furlough parole they are all together different concepts here i am just going to reduce my sentence of punishment furlough and parole is about you know coming out of the jail at some specific purposes for some sub, some specific reasons that is furlough and parole of course between them you have one more question coming where i'll be explaining the difference between the two but first of all let, let's get one thing clear remission is totally different from furlough or parole now as per the supreme court observation uh, here the thing is that the government of the state where offender was sentenced actually supreme court says where the the, the person has got the uh, sentence where he got the punishment that particular state government has a right that is the appropriate government they can only grant the remission now in this case it, it was the gujarat government where the offense happened and the sentence took place and that's why the gujarat government is the legitimate uh, has a legitimate right to appropriate or approve the remission of, of a person but the point is but the point is it's not like remission can be given for any reason no there are some specific reasons like like if you if you look at the if you look at the whole history of the remission basically uh, 
द स्टेट ऑफ हरियाणा वर्सेज महेंद्र सिंह वेरी फेमस केस वेर सुप्रीम कोर्ट क्लैरिफाइड दैट नो कन्विक्ट हैज अ फंडामेंटल राइट ऑफ रेमिशन डोंट थिंक रेमिशन इज योर फंडामेंटल राइट फॉर एग्जाम्पल फरलो फरलो कंसिडर टू बी ए लीगल राइट राइट रेमिशन इज योर लीगल राइट बट इट इट इज नॉट योर फंडामेंटल राइट इट्स नॉट लाइक एवरी प्रिजनर इज सपोज टू गेट रेमिशन ऑफ कोर्स नॉट रेमिशन डिपेंड्स ऑन मेनी थिंग्स इट्स अ लीगल राइट बिकॉज अंडर आर्टिकल ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन ऑफ कोर्स वी हैव सम सेफ गार्ड फॉर द कॉन्विक्ट दैट इज अ डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ थिंग बट मेकिंग इट फंडामेंटल वुड बी वुड बी अ क्योर्स ऑल टूगेदर देन देर इज नो नो पॉइंट गिविंग बिग पनिशमेंट इफ यू आर गोइंग टू मेक दम शॉर्ट बाय रेमिशन ऑफ कोर्स एंड देर आर सर्टन ग्राउंड सर्टन ग्राउंड ऑन विच रेमिशन कैन बी ग्रांटेड फॉर एग्जाम्पल एंड या दिस इज अ वेरी क्लियर इंस्ट्रक्शन बाय सुप्रीम कोर्ट स्टेट्स कैनॉट आर्बिट्रेरी विदाउट रीजन विदाउट लॉजिक यू कैंट गो एंड गिव एनी बडी रेमिशन ऑफकोर्स देर देर हैज टू बी सम सर्टन यू नो पॉइंट वाइल डिसाइडिंग इफ यू इफ द रेमिशन इज टू बी गिवन और नॉट of course the seriousness of the crime is taken into account the status of the co accused is also checked the how the offender has behaved in jail is also checked in fact there was a very famous case called lakshman naskar was versus the union of india 2000 where supreme court clearly laid down five grounds for considering the remission and those grounds include whether offense is an individual act of crime that does not affect the society if that is the case okay remission can be given whether there is a chance of the crime being repeated in future if the person is likely to repeat the same offense again then the remission should not be given if the convict has lost the potentiality to commit a crime then yeah it his he or she uh, is going to be considered a bit safe and can be given a remission whether any purpose is being served in keeping the convict in prison or or it is safe to make the person go and you know get jailed up with the with his family so considering all these factors the remission is supposed to be given when i talk about the uh, pardoning power of the uh, president and governor remember guys the president and governor both have pardoning power under different articles respectively but the pardoning power of the president is going it is absolutely broader than the governor there are two things which president can do governor cannot number one if there is any punishment or the sentence in the court martial case then in that case only president can give you the pardon not the uh, governor governor is not in a capacity to uh, you know to take any decision with respect to the court martial similarly if it is a death sentence if somebody has got a death punishment only president has a power to give the pardon in case of the death punishment not the governor so these court martial and death these are the two uh, exceptionals or two uh, specific cases where only president has a reside uh, has a has a right to decide whether pardon to be given or not that makes the power of uh, uh, president bit broader than that of governor i hope this everything is clear now if you go to the question now you have learned everything with me so please try start eliminating the techniques now the question says every convict has fundamental right of remission you have just understood no it's just a legal right that they have that's it similarly remission is about reducing the period of the sentence with or without changing the character absolutely wrong it is absolutely mandatory in remission you can only reduce the time you can't reduce or change the character so you cannot change the character of the punishment that needs to be the same only second statement is correct so my answer has to be only one i would say this question was a very easy question because pardoning power is probably one of the very basic topic that we give um, in the in the in the polity books of yours right so very easily you could have attempted this question options were easy questions were easy very simple language very basic concepts you could have done it very very easily now the next question is the talk of the town 2024 is the election year and um, in this election year wow we are going to go into the polls in couple of uh, days na- from na- from now onwards it's just a matter of like 7 uh, 8 or 9 days 
that India is going into the polls. Now the question is with respect to the VVPAT. Very, very important point of the VVPAT. VVPAT full form is something you always have to remember because the name itself says a lot about the purpose of this. So VVPAT stands for Voter Verified Paper Audit Trail. So this VVPAT machine is something you have to consider. So let me, let me first show you what exactly this machine is and how it works. You have in front of you this very beautiful picture of the VVPAT. So we all know this is our EVM, electronic voting machine. And this is the con this, this uh, machine which is attached to the EVM is called a VVPAT machine. Do not forget to see it's the Bharat Electronics that they have made this particular machine. Now the point is, normally there were some doubts with respect to EVM and many people were doubtful if the EVM can be hacked or not. There were some... Uh, some doubts with respect to that. So in order to clarify any doubt with respect to the EVM, so what, what, the, what, uh, what was done, a machine was devised as a VVPAT. Now if you are, let's say, if you are giving vote, you are pressing the B button, you want to give the vote to the B, the moment you register your vote in the AVM, the very same time, uh, uh, this VVPAT is going to show you a paper trail like the, the, the this is an electronic vote that you are giving and this is your paper uh, vote which is automatically generated in the VVPAT and you can cross verify you can see if if uh, like whatever whatever vote I have just uh, given to whatever candidate if that is correctly registered or not so this is just to cross verify so as to eliminate the doubt of EVM malfunctioning or something like that and here as per the latest rules, uh, it, 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 this light is on and you can see the result of your vote just for 7 seconds. Before 2016, it was, it, the light was on for 15 seconds but now somehow I don't know why but the government, the election commission of India has reduced the time period to 7 seconds. Now only a person gets 7 seconds to see and cross check if the vote they have uh, given is correctly registered or not. That is the purpose. Now, if you go back to the history of, uh, of the VVPAT, this is independent verification printer attached to the EVM. We have just understood in that, in that right? Now, very interestingly, uh, it was Dr. Subramaniam Swami versus Election Commission of India 2013 case. That is very landmark case where the Supreme Court clearly said that VVPAT is indispensable requirement of the free and fair elections. For the first time, the VVPAT was developed way back in 2011 and uh, after two years only, the, the Supreme Court clarified it's absolutely important to have the VVPAT. In fact, let me tell you, 2019 Lok Sabha election became the first general election of India to have 100% EVMs attached to the VVPAT. For the first time as a trial, VVPAT was used way back in 2013 in Nagaland's by-election but now to 2019 was the first Lok Sabha elections to have the 100% EVMs attached to the VVPAT. Very very important fact you never know you have this question coming. Please remember one thing, the VVPAT machines can be assessed only and only by polling officers. It's not like everyone can go and get the access of the VVPAT, no. The access to the machine is given only to the polling officer. That's it. That's all. So that actually makes us uh, uh, makes it easy for us to eliminate the second option, which says VVPAT can be accessed by both polling polling officers and booth level political party. Remember, this cannot be done. Like apply your logic. If you are allowing other than other than polling officers, you are allowing other people to interfere in the VVPAT. How could you make maintain the law and order? How can you make the elections peaceful? There would be conflict, there would be chaos at the polling booth if you are going to give access to the political party representatives and there are always chances of tempering, right? So very logically, the VVPAT access is to be given to only polling booth officer because they are the Sarkari Babus, uh, Sarkari officers on the duty, right? So you... you um, can't give the control or the access in the hands of any political party 
representative very logical question so first statement very straightforward the question was easy and i am very sure with even if, if even if you have not heard you could have taken a little bit of risk with little bit logic in your head and easily this question could have been attempted not 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 at all a difficult question so answer in this case is supposed to be uh, a answer supposed to be one only because second statement is wrong that brings us to the next question number 25 question now i have already mentioned uh, in in the last uh, in in a few question back that there is a question on parole and furlough what is furlough you need to understand the difference between the two and then you can solve the questions but mind it the question is about which statement is not correct so be very careful with that okay now what is this i'm sure we all have heard the term parole and the furlough right please understand the difference so uh, parole and furlough are basically they are kind of break that a prisoner gets while serving the sentences Parole is given to a prisoner if that person is there for a short term detention. The period of the release. Now, please understand if somebody is, uh, you know, booked for a certain amount of time, the person can come out of the jail on parole. But make sure that like, for example, if a person has come for 20 days, you know, if let's say somebody has come for 20 days or 30 days on a parole, but make sure you remember this the period of the release under parole is not going, going to be counted in the total period of that sentence for example if somebody has got a 12 month punishment and that person has come out on parole for two times and like he has come for 30 30 days so it's not like you have to serve only 10 months in the jail no the period that you are on parole not to be counted you still have to serve the complete 12 months in the jail but in case of the furlough furlough if somebody some uh, some prisoner comes out on a furlough that period is counted towards the total period why is it so the answer is very simple logic is very simple because furlough is given in to those uh, uh, prisoners who are serving long term detention if somebody is there for 10 years in jail or 7 years in jail it's a long period if somebody is there on on that if and, and that person comes on a furlough we are going to count that time also as a part of this punishment please remember furlough has a limit a person can come on a furlough with the maximum number of 14 days whereas the parole which is there for the short term detention is can last for at least one month so if person coming on the parole and coming on the furlough these are the two difference furlough for long term prisoners parole uh, uh, is for short term furlough is for long term prisoners Parlow for one month, furlough is uh, sorry, parole is given for one month, furlough given for maximum 14 days. Where parole is not to be seen as a matter of right. I mean, you, like no uh, prisoner can claim that he or she deserves a right on parole. No. A person, a prisoner is given parole for specific reasons. For example, somebody has died in their family. You have to go attend the funeral, then you will be released on a parole whereas the furlough is seen as a matter of right why because prisoners also have some of their rights and if person is serving a very long sentence it is their right so that they uh, they can be released fr from the jail for certain period of time so that the person can maintain some kind of social ties with the family or the society because once that person is going to complete his sentence and going back to society the thing should not be really awkward for them so it can be granted even without any reason for a furlough you don't need to have any specific reason to go on a parole there has to be some specific reason where parole is granted by the dc the divisional commissioner furlough can be given by deputy inspector of the uh, uh, general which is dig prisons please remember furlough cannot be generally generally it's not like cannot be i'm sorry it should be like furlough generally not denied because it's a kind of right that we are we have given to the prisoners so generally the furlough demands are not denied most of the cases furlough is given but parole can be denied if if the authorities think there is not sufficient reason for a person to go on a parole yeah the person can be denied the parole right also 
if you if you talk about the frequency the parole can be granted multiple times and in case of furlough it can be give, given for a limited time only sanjay dat was a best example that you can relate Re remember when sanjay dat was serving his sentence in the jail sanjay dat still used to come out and uh, do all the shootings of his film so most of the cases he was out on parole remember so that is the latest celebrity case that you can think of now if you go to the question you have this first statement as the wrong one is furlough short term detention no it is actually the parole parole is short term furlough is long term so that makes first as wrong parole is not matter of the right correct uh, and it is given for specific reason absolutely correct so now this question was which statement not correct so first has to be the answer one is not correct very uh, easy kind of question very straight forward question without any twist and turns could have been attempted very very easily guys that brings us to the question 26 i mean we have done it so so many times we have talked about the uh, cbi we have talked about cbi so many number of times so now we are going to talk about the four five statements with respect to the cbi and probably you may have a question on cbi this year because it's already in news for so so many reasons you think of the cbi please remember the very first thing many people have this misconception many people think the cbi is under the ministry of home affair but that is not the case the cbi actually functions under department of the personal ministry of uh, ministry of personal pension public grievances now this is the ministry under which the cbi work number one number two you think of cbi we all think about delhi special police established act 1946 and that actually misleads us and we start believing oh there is a act of parliament oh there then cbi must be statutory but remember with CBI, always remember the two words very, very clearly. CBI is non-constitutional. In our constitution, there is no mention of CBI. And it is also non-statutory. There is nothing called as a CBI act or something like that. No. CBI is simply an executive body which derives its power from act of the parliament. That does not make CBI itself a statutory body, not a case. But still CBI is very important. CBI is India's nodal agency that actually coordinates international investigations in Interpol or something and represents India at Interpol. Understood. So remember three things. CBI, non-constitutional, non-statutory. Also remember one thing. When it comes to the CBI composition, it's a very common question and we have seen a couple of times there was a news with respect to some controversy with the with the appointment of the CBI directors. A lot of controversy has, and especially in the last couple of years, we have seen some kind of problematic decisions where we know the CBI is always to be headed by a director. And that CBI director is to be assisted by some special directors or additional directors uh, coming from the ranks of the DIG and SP and all that kind of thing. Fine who appoint the cbi director see before the lokpal act the cbi director was appointed by the uh, delhi special police establishment act directly but now the lokpal act governs the appointment of the cbi director because now we have got the lokpal act so right now how the cbi director is appointed as per the uh, provisions of the lokpal act is very important now the central government appoint the director of the CBI, fine, how? On the recommendations of a search committee. So the search committee consists of three members. One, Prime Minister as chairperson, the Chief Justice of India as Supreme Court judge and leader of opposition as the third member. So it's a three member body. These three member search committee recommends the name to the center and the central government approves the name of the director generally at least a two-year tenure security is given to the uh, cbi you remember recently the director of the cbis were given ex extensions again and again and that's why even the supreme court had to intervene and uh, tell the cbi the director to step down clear everyone fine one special point you need to understand 
whenever you think of CBI, now CBI of course CBI has a right to go to any state and has a right to uh, you know uh, do their investigation. But do you know for that the CBI needs to have permission from the state which, which in legal terms called the consent of the state. The state can give CBI two types of the consents. One a general consent and other specific consent. Normally, normally the states give CBI a general consent. General consent means where the CBI need not to take permission again and again and the, if the state government has full faith in the CBI and the working of the CBI, state government says you have our permission, don't ask again and again. Whenever you have to come to the state, do investigation, do it, no problem. But sometimes, like in present times, there are many, many states, especially the states which are governed by the uh, non-BJP, uh, you know, uh, chief ministers, they have actually stood up against the CBI and they have, they have withdrawn their general consent. Now, now the CBI, if the C, like for example, Telangana, for example, uh, Delhi, for example, Punjab, for example, uh, West Bengal, for example, Kerala, there are so many states who have withdrawn their general consent. Now, the CBI, if they have to register any fresh case, they actually have to go and ask for the permission of the state. But there is one thing I would like to specifically mention guys. For example, for example, what if there is already a case which is running in the state? If the case is already under investigation, in that case, nothing is going to change. Even if you withdraw general consent, doesn't matter. The CBI, is, the CBI still has all the rights and power to go and investigate without any consent because that case was undergoing the time there was already general consent. Understood? And also, if let's say any Supreme Court or High Court has ordered the CBI to go and do the investigation, if that is or that's a judicial order for that purpose also, no state concern is required. If I come to the question, I have certain points to figure out. For example, uh, the question says the CBI is statutory body. Is it statutory? It is non-statutory. It only derive its power from the DSPE Act. So my option one is not uh, correct. So I have, I'm going to eliminate my option this, right? Second is absolutely correct. And the question also says second needs to be correct. Now only problem is if third or fourth, which is correct. And that there you have just uh, understood with me, the, the third statement is incorrect. Why? We just have understood that the center appoints the director of the CBI based on recommendation of a search committee. Uh, and who is there in search committee? P Prime Minister was there, yes. Leader of opposition was there, yes. But was the speaker Lok Sabha there? No. The third member was the CGI, not the speaker of the Lok Sabha. And that's why I'm going to eliminate. My, my answer is going to be um, a C, that is 2 and 4, right? So I think this question, very medium, very basic kind of question and could have been attempted easily because no, absolutely no twist and turns. Simple question was asked to you with respect to the CBI. Now the question number 27. The question 27 says, which of the following communities are notified under the National Commission for Minorities Act 1992? So you just have to tell me out of the four, the Christian, Sikh, Jain, Parsi, actually all four are there. All the four are considered to be minorities as per the National Commission for Minorities. Let me, let me tell you guys in India, there are only two types of, uh, two types of minorities which are being classified or considered. In, in, in India, the two uh, minorities are e one, either it can be religious minority or could be linguistic minority. Here, the Christian, Sikh, Jain, Parsis, all the four are under the religious minorities of India. So here the answer is supposed to be D. So very obvious. Now you know about like other than Hindu religion, Hindus are in majority. Every other religious community in India comes as a minority. Be it Christian, Sikh, Jain, Buddhist, Parsi, Muslims, all are religious minorities, right? So only Hindus are in religious majority in India. So that very obviously I can give the answer as D. Very easy, straightforward I, I can attempt. But there is something you need to learn from this question. 
okay fine i understand that today the union government has set up this national national commission for minorities that's fine initially only five religious communities were recognized uh, by this particular act the jains were not included as religious minorities later on in 2014 the jains were also notified as another minority country now this let's say if the question comes in your exam and the question says from the very beginning all six are given the minority status you would say no or the question can be which of the following was the last to receive the minority status so then that case answer is supposed to be jain because jains were added into the minorities uh, under in 2014 only guys right that is important so next question very straightforward question so very straightforward question number 28 absolutely nothing you have to do it's a straight question i am telling you from the day one try to remember the most important supreme court verdicts because you never know mostly these kind of questions come as match the following or they can be asked directly as an mcq like in this case you just have to tell me the kihoto holohan case associated with what was it dpsp no fundamental rights no center state relation no the kihoto holohan case is, is with respect to anti defection law which is there under the 10th schedule of indian constitution okay so answer very easy very straight forward now i want you guys to do one thing as your homework please remember i want you to tell me okay fine i know the three are the wrong answer but can you tell me the famous verdicts that relates to these three and if you know then do let me in the comment box that which was the famous verdict with respect to fundamental rights which was which was the famous uh, with with respect to dpsps right so do tell me in the comment box if you remember any of the famous verdicts here the answer is supposed to be d nothing nothing much to explain so we know we all know about the uh, you know anti defection law to actually inculcate more ethics more morality in the political parties and to clean the party of deflection the anti defection law was introduced uh, in india in 1985 and after that part the 10th schedule was also added and today the 10th schedule is famously known as the anti defection law that we have before 1985 case uh, the 10th schedule case it was 1992 the kihoto holohan case where supreme court has clarified that if any elected member of one party crosses the party after election that person is subject to be disqualified and supreme court has clarified about everything that you need to take care while dealing with these kind of defection cases in this anti defection law the speaker of the lok sabha was given immense power and immense role it is a speaker who decides if this is the case of disqualification or not that is important guys okay so straight forward question can come now there is a question very detailed question 29 with respect to anti defection guys question 29 you have to uh, you know be very careful so you 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 just have learned with me anti defection law first thing is absolutely correct the decision whether person to be disqualified or not the decision of the chairman in case of rajya sabha and speaker in case of lok sabha is final yes it is final it is final but please remember it is still uh, subject to judicial review don't think if the decision is final you can't challenge that in the court of course you can so it is uh, it is final but then it is also subjected to the judicial review very important thing you have to remember okay the second and third statements are wrong you know there there are certain uh, you know exceptions or certain rules where where defection you are not going to attract defection towards yourself for example if you are a nominated legislator if you are nominated even in lok sabha or rajya sabha you are a nominated member you know nominated members are not supposed to join a political party 
after six months of their they become the legislature of their membership i mean every nominated member has the opportunity they can choose they can join a party no problem they can join any political party they want because they don't have a political background they are simply selected uh, nominated to the house so they can join a party but that they have to do it uh, before the six month period in the very first six month they are supposed to do that okay if there is any independent any independent legislature any person who has uh, won the election not on any party ticket but by itself so that is called the independent legislature that person will be disqualified straight away if that person joins a political party because his basis of winning the election was that the people uh, rejected all political parties and shown belief belief in that one person right so independent mp or mla not supposed to do not supposed to join any political party anytime nominated one they can join political party in the first six months but if they do it after six months that could should be considered as a uh, uh, entity that could be considered as a defection and then the punishment would be under an uh, anti-defection law so very obvious very clear the two are interchanged in the question with only one as the right answer you will find this kind of question directly this question was given in the books of polity i don't consider it at all difficult very easy question could have been attempted without any trouble guys clear okay now that takes us to the question number 30 question number 30 is with respect to the nalsa which is the national legal service authority nalsa now what i am supposed to remember with respect to nalsa let's try to understand so when you think of the NALSA, when you think of NALSA, few things you need to uh, remember, you need to understand. Number one, the NALSA was actually constituted under the Legal Service Authority Act 1987. This act is very, very important. Star mark, three stars for that. So NALSA is under a Leg Legal Service Authority Act, number one. NALSA's main function is to monitor and review the effectiveness of the legal aid programs. And that's why it develops the rules and the procedures for providing legal service authorities or legal services in India under the Act. That is the sole purpose why NALSA was created in 1987 Act. NALSA also distributes the funding and the grants to the state legal service authorities and non-profit organizations, those which help them execute legal aid systems that is how the nalsa functions in terms of funding and the grant distribution please remember one thing when you think of the nalsa when you think of the nalsa remember nalsa shall consist the chief justice of india as the pattern in chief the cgi is the pattern in chief of the nalsa whereas a serving or a retired judge of a supreme court shall be the executive chairman so remember the cgi has the power to become the pattern in chief and chief executive chairman can be any retired or serving judge of the supreme court remember can you remember the three if you can so now you have the option that the first and the second statements are absolutely correct yes the first i mean i understand of course many people can't guess this that, that make every sense I mean the the this can be different or any tricks can be played i understand first is difficult to understand but second and third are quite easy to eliminate and quite easy to choose because we know the supreme the pattern in chief is always and always given to the chief justice of india it is very well known fact and the serving or retired judge can only become the executive commission committee that's it nothing else so here only two options are correct i understand the question was a little bit medium i'll not say tough but medium question but you can take a risk if at least two out of three you are in a position except the first one you can still solve the question by uh, remembering and recalling small 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 uh, facts with you guys that is very important right question number 31 
question is with, the, with respect to the 91st constitutional amendment act 2003 fine fair enough so what exactly we have to remember with respect to the amendment act very important right guys so you first have to understand the basics with me then we'll come back so please remember as per the act as per this particular 91st uh, constitutional amendment act this act has introduced article 75 1a this article says the total number of ministers including the prime minister in the council of ministers shall not exceed 15 percent of the total strength so right now if my lok sabha is 543 the maximum number of ministers council of ministers that modi government can have is 15 percent of this it's an upper limit which is set and when i say 15 percent whatever the number comes that number must include the prime minister also so prime minister is under that 15 percent bracket not like 15 percent and prime minister no including pm 15 percent can be the council of ministers of that case right again this 91st amendment act also added few more points like for example it says the minimum strength of the council of ministers uh, including the cm in a state shall be 12 i mean no state can have no bigger state can have less than 12 member as the council of ministers whereas the maximum is same as 15 percent of the legislative assembly but you can say that sir what if what if the states are really small if you have state like sikkim mizoram goa arunachal here the minimum strength is seven uh, that is prescribed and that is the same kind of limit we have also seen with the with the delhi government right that's why so only limited number of people can can have this okay so i hope this this is uh, clear to everyone now please remember one more thing though the third statement does not belo belong uh, to this uh, thing so if you go back to the question so clearly guys the first is not correct because it says the 15 percent excludes the pm no it definitely includes the pm that makes sense so i can eliminate my option number one from this point even this is going to get eliminated the second is also wrong because the minimum strength in a state council minister is not 15 it is 12 and in for the smaller state it comes down to 7 but 15 is not the number so clearly i can eliminate my option two so this question by simply eliminating can give me the right answer as a three only what what is the third statement says the provision about the exemption from disqualification in case of split by one third it was deleted yes initially if one third members they simply leave their original party and go and join other party that used to be considered as a as a as an exception but now now there has to be at least minimum two third people they need to switch then only it will be considered legal now if one third people go and go to the other party that still will be considered as a split and in that case there would be anti-defection law punishment for that particular members right so this question because of thanks to elimination this question despite being a medium kind of level was still easy for us because we could have solved this by simply eliminating the wrong options question 32 is with respect to the mulya pravaha 2.0 guys what is mulya pravaha what it relates to mulya pravaha is actually relates to the education sector see mulya is values you know it talks about the values so uh, let me let me uh, ask you if you have simply converted the name as mulya prava to values which sector you think the values are inculcated is it soft diplomacy no corporate no swachh bharat no simply by converting the name mulya prava to the values it makes me believe that it must relate to education sector so yes the question was medium but not something that i could not have attempted with the common sense without any pack panic i can still solve the question right so option answer is supposed to be b now getting into the detail what exactly the mulya prava is so now the details are important you may have a question coming it 
as a stand alone question if, if the question can be a detailed question on mulya prava mulya prava released by the university grant commission the ugc the university grant commission the ugc worked under minister of education we know that so mulya prava major aim is to build the value based institutions including fundamental duties and constitutional values mulya prava 2.0 it also highlight the need for unbiased objective decision making abolishing discriminatory privileges also encouraging to punish whosoever person is corrupt so now this mulya prava thanks to mulya prava the quality education the value based addition and the values which are going to go along with you the whole life that is being emphasized so remember these few things remember these few ideas with respect to mulya prava so what kind of values the word mulya is value so what kind of values we are going to target under the the mulya prava if you, if you can if i can zoom it for you guys so first remember uh, it is the ugc university grant commission that is under ministry of education they have released the mulya prava number 1 number 2 if you look so clearly you can see these are the values we are talking about the values that needs to be inculcated are respectfulness the harmony belongingness integrity dedication global citizenship constitutional values trusteeship sustainability inclusiveness commitment well that's all that is required no so this is about the mulya prava 2.0 clear everyone so i hope this you guys remember which values we are targeting which values we are focusing upon right okay sir that takes us to the question number 33 somnath temple what i should remember about somnath somnath temple you think of somnath you think of gujarat yes that's fine so somnath temple is located on the western coast of gujarat yes sir we know that it is one of the 12 jyotirlings yes somnath temple is dedicated to lord shiva in fact not just one of the 12 it is the first jyotirling that we have in our country somnath temple has a huge history we'll talk about that but remember few facts it is one of, there in india there are 12 jyotirlings that belongs to lord shiva and the shivism uh, the somnath temple built in the maru gurjan style yes sir the present one Somnath temple was constructed many times there are many many constructions that relate to Somnath temple but i am going to talk about the present one so if you look at the present architecture it belongs to maru gurjara style now what exactly this style you must be wondering i'll tell you don't worry here the two options were correct answer c now was this question tough yes art and culture i don't have any guess what can i guess the architecture i can't i can't tell you if it is one of the 12 jyotirling so this question you can take a risk if you at least know or have some idea otherwise better to skip this question because very very fact based and very little scope of any guesswork but just to tell you little bit about the somnath temple look at this beautiful temple guys this is your somnath temple dedicated to lord shiva in the state of gujarat first among the 12 jyotirlings enshrined in of the lok of the lord shiva right it is believed that the very first time the somnath temple was built around the 9th century ad and that time it was believed that it was built by the moon god with gold and later on we we believe it was built by ravana in silver or krishna by wood or bhim dev in stone so there are many stories and lot of things about it but i am talking about the present one the present temple that we have as the somnath temple it was reconstructed lastly 1951 and the latest one is reconstructed in the chalukya style of the hindu temple do remember this fact absolutely important guys the present one is something we have to remember okay now the present one which i am talking as a it is built as a chalukyan style so that chalukyan or solanki style of the temple architecture has another name as maru gurjara style so please be very careful the upsc may ask you the question 
but by changing the name so question comes by maru gurjar or chalukya solanki same thing but what are the specialities you have in front of you the layout plan can you see the layout plan of this maru gurjara style in every maru maru gurjara style temple it is a style of hindu architecture that flourished under the patronage of the solanki rulers solanki rulers were there in india especially in the northwest part of india including gujarat and rajasthan very special feature of these maru gurjara style is that the temple walls they don't have much carvings they they don't waste the time on temple wall carvings the garb griha is there as as in any other temple but very special feature of the maru gurjara style every temple of this style always going to have a tank a water tank yes that is used to be called as the surya kund or the step tank and it's a unique feature of the maru gurjara style i hope that that makes sense to everyone clear everyone okay next again straight forward question pencil portal okay pencil means what who who uh, uses pencil the most so if i literally convert that pencil it automatically comes child as the right answer it's the it's the children they only work with pencils right so pencil portal not about higher education not tribal not skill development it is the child labor so pencil portal yes our guess work is right so i really have to get, make a guess but that guess has to be filled with some logic right so this question i think it was a easy question very straight forward question what is a pencil portal you need to understand i i told you the trick the pencil the child and the child labor so pencil platform actually stands for platform for effective enforcement of no child labor portal and that's why the most appropriate name is the pencil platform this is not a new one this pencil platform is an electronic platform we launched way back in 2017 and this was actually launched for the effective implementation of the national child labor project that we have and we really want to make india a child labor free nation so to to achieve that kind of goal to achieve that kind of goal this pencil platform was established now this platform provides platform give uh, it gives platform for all to raise a complaint against the child labor what this project is what is this national child labor project under which the pencil platform is created so remember this again you may have a stand alone mcq coming on that as, uh, as well so national labor uh, national child labor project scheme it's a central sector scheme under ministry of labor and employment in 2016 this scheme was then merged with the samagra uh, samagra shiksha abhiyan under the ministry of education but the aim objectives are clear like this pencil platform and the child labor project is all about eliminating all in india we really want to rescue uh, and withdraw the children from the hazardous occupation they go in we really want to make a tracking monitoring uh, reporting kind of system so as so that we can crack down the child labor thing in india that is there right okay so next question 35 is with respect to the nano urea very common very famous topic guys now which statement is correct you have to figure out with respect to uh, nano urea so yes few things you have to remember first thing why nano urea was in news recently of course once it was news what once it was in news with the time it was created it was uh, launched in the market but now as per many reports many reports are saying that applying the nano urea actually decrease the rice wheat wheat yields as compared to the the natural ones so if that is the case of course there are big question marks about the effectivity of nano urea what exactly is nano urea as the name says you know the urea is quite famous and very uh, very popular among the farming communities right people use urea a lot nano urea is nothing but essentially a urea which is a nitrogenous form fertilizer but that in the form of nano particles 
that in the form of nano particles that is what is this so called uh, nano urea and because the nano urea i am talking about uh, nano particles of urea the particle size is just like 12 20 to 50 nanometer that's it that's it that is the real meaning of nano urea why we are using it why we are talking about nano urea there are a lot of advantages instead of applying the conventional form of urea which is nothing but nitro nitrogenous fertilizer you can you have many advantages of urea for example number one while conventional urea is normal one has efficiency of hardly 25 percent 75 percent of the urea that i spray in my uh, farm is going to get waste only 25 percent is going to be used by the plants but here effectivity of the liquid nano urea was as high as 80 to 90 percent 80 90 percent is something which is which can revolutionize the way farming happens in india right nano urea is not just about increasing the production it is also environmental friendly yes nano urea help in reducing the country's subsidy bill it also reduces the unbalanced indiscriminate use of conventional urea thereby minimizing the soil water air pollution provides a targeted supply of the nutrients targeted supply of nutrients to cross to crops as the liquid nano is sprayed directly onto the leaves so these are some of the advantages that we have with respect to nano urea in india nano urea developed by who the liquid nano urea was actually produced in india by ifco ifco stands for indian farmer fertilizer cooperative the ifco and the liquid nano urea was actually created as an alternative to the conventional nitrogen fertilizers as a replacement of that this has been uh, made whenever you think of a plant please remember thinking of the plant think about the two type of nutrients the very same in our human body like we have some macronutrients we have some micronutrients the the so called the carbohydrates the proteins the fats all of them they are a part of macronutrients when it comes to the micronutrients we have the vitamins we have the minerals all of them part of the micro minerals now similar in case of plants just to give you one extra information remember guys in case of the plants if you if you look at this slide the plants also has some macro and micronutrients in case of the plants the macronutrient includes the carbon the hydrogen the oxygen nitrogen phosphorus potassium calcium sulfur magnesium all of them are considered to be macronutrients and i really recommend you guys uh, when you download the pdf kindly study definitely at least not if you if you're not going to spend more time at least have a one reading at least have a at least have a one reading uh, with respect to this particular study right now you have to uh, talk with respect to the micronutrients micronutrients of the plants include the iron include the copper the zinc manganese nickel boron uh, molybdenum and the chlorine so this this all uh, include uh, or are considered as a part of micronutrients and i'm very sure you must have heard of the npk fertilizer which is the nitrogen phosphorus potassium that is the npk fertilizer very common name that is being used many times uh, when it comes to the fertilizer systems of india so do remember that guys absolutely important now comes the question number 36 so question 36 is with respect to the wto the world trade organization agreements on agriculture there are many many components of the wto but when it comes to agriculture on uh, uh, agreement on agriculture which is also called as aoa this is absolutely important for the upsc exam okay so now what we are supposed how we are supposed to uh, take care of this particular question will will come on to the question first let me tell you the details of the wto and the other parts so uh, right now india and wto was in news for many reasons because recently 30th ministerial conference of the wto took place uh, in uh, 2024 february 26 in the abu dhabi and in this 30th ministerial conference india actually urged wto 
to find a lasting solution to the matters of the public stock holding for the food security okay so that because india always has this issue with this whenever you talk about wto wto always has some issue with the the way indian agriculture is being supported by the government be it the food security uh, whether it is about uh, the, the holding uh, you know of the food grains everything is being uh, has many you know it has some issues friction with wto now recently why this ministerial conference is important because it's the highest decision making of wto you may have mcq on that also so please remember whenever you think of the wto the ministerial conference is the one having the highest decision making body now specifically talking about agreement on agriculture aoa this agreement on agriculture it was negotiated during the uruguay round way back in 1986 and finally the agriculture on agreement uh, on agriculture was formally ratified in 1994 during the marrakesh morocco round and finally after like wto also came into uh, being 1995 so along wto coming into ex existence the aoa also came into existence in 1995 that that up to this point is clear now what exactly we cover in the aoa what is this agriculture on uh, agreement on agriculture this agreement on agriculture is based on the three pillars one with respect to the rules about market access it talks about the domestic support like how much government should support the agriculture because if you are supporting too much agriculture domestically of course the prices are not going to be competitive the other countries are going to have the disadvantage if you are subsidizing too much on your agriculture so domestic support is also uh, should be under check and export subsidies are also to be reduced and to be checked so that there there is supposed there is supposed to be a fair a fair pricing on agriculture product there, there has to be a, a fair uh, kind of thing with respect to the agricultural products and the export markets now if i talk about the aoa which which is about promoting the fair competition reduce the trade distorting subsidies ensuring the ma uh, market access to agriculture products right under this under this uh, a lot of negotiations and india mainly has problem with respect to the aoa only because because india uh, uh, has has this problem when it comes to reducing the domestic food subsidies india says we can't do that because india has to take care of the food uh, security and that is where india has a great concern because india has a large population which still needs government support for the food security purpose if india agrees to the aoa completely india can't have its food security and that is why there is a big tussle between wto and india for for many many years okay if you go back to the question the only problem that we have in this particular question uh, like every every other fact was correct the only problem was the second statement we just have understood that agriculture agreement on agriculture it was negotiated in 1986 but was that bali round the round is wrong the name of the round is wrong it was the uruguay round it was the uruguay round when aoa was negotiated yes when it comes to ratification it was the marrakesh morocco absolutely correct so only second one is wrong this question was easy no this was a tough question shall i risk it don't risk it for no reason if you can afford to skip it i you better skip it because this information has four uh, this question has four statements every statement is heavily relying on facts with little bit of common sense or logic scope so better to skip than taking unnecessary risk and this answer has to be c right okay that takes us to the question number 37 the 37 question was a um, very straight forward question i mean again no scope of guess what the say the word the question says the word bugun leochila relates to what is it medicinal plant reptile animal no it's a bird how to solve this question sir very very difficult it's a tough question tough because you have this is purely and purely based on the fact how am i supposed to make any uh, guess work here i can't 
it's it's only that if i have read about it only i can solve it so better to skip than to approach this kind of question very straightforward just to tell you the answer uh this particular bird that we're talking about bugon liochola it is one of the first bird species that was discovered in india that we have today at a very less numbers are left Though it was the first bird species to be discovered after 1947, it lives on the Bugun's community lands. That that uh, where it was first spotted in Arunachal Pradesh in 1995. However, today it is a critically endangered species with only 14 to 20 individuals left. If you look at this beautiful bird, it is it's a song bird. It's a song bird actually. It is bigger than sparrow, but you know smaller than pigeon but right now it is critically endangered iucn status are absolutely important for you to remember whenever you're talking about any biodiversity the next question is again with respect to the biodiversity that is indian leopard so few things that you have to remember when it, when you talk about indian leopards guys so what exactly you are supposed to remember let me tell you so indian leopards they are like there are different leopards in different parts of the world When you talk about Indian leopards, we, Indian leopards are the smallest of the big cats. Yeah, but Indian leopards, being smallest, has a very special ability to adapt to variety of the habitats. Indian leopards are nocturnal animals. They generally go hunt at the night. Right now, talking about Indian leopards, don't get confused with cheetah. I'm talking about leopard. Cheetah is a different uh, thing. Indian cheetah. Uh, Asian cheetah is no more. We are that's why we are importing from Africa. I'm talking about the leopards. In India, there are twelve thousand to fourteen thousand in individuals, and that's why the IUCN status of the leopards in India is still vulnerable. But we protect them under Schedule One. When it comes to the habitat of the leopards, remember they are found in tropical rainforest, dry, deciduous, temperate. But very interestingly, they do not occur. in the mangroves of sundarban because there you have the royal bengal tiger and where the tiger exists you don't have the leopards and they are solitary animals and that's why they avoid going into the sundarban so please remember they are found almost everywhere but not in the sundarbans okay important now one thing so here you have all the variety look there are so so many types of leopards that we have and this is the smallest one so yes indian leopard is the smallest of all that we have then you have arabian african leopard persian amur area leopard north chinese indo chinese javan javan uh, leopard is what we used to call bagheera in bachpan right uh, then we have sri lankan leopard also so this whole this area we we have the rich species of leopards there was a recently there was a report uh, with respect to the numbers of uh, the leopards in india as per all the recent reports the central india and the eastern ghat area has the highest population of leopards the central and eastern ghats where the western ghats shivalik and gangetic plains are the following in terms of numbers but central india itself uh you know and eastern ghats together has a population of more than 80 8800 uh, leopards but when it comes to state wise remember remember the state wise it is madhya pradesh that actually has the largest population of leopards madhya pradesh having the largest population of leopards followed by maharashtra karnataka and tamil nadu it is absolutely important for you to remember this fact state wise even more chances the question can be asked okay so now if you go back to the question you clearly can understand what is the problem with the second statement first is correct the second is not correct is it karnataka having the largest number of leopards no it's the madhya pradesh we just have and this is as per the status of leopards in india 2022 report straight forward question is there i understand but again i will not say this was an easy one this was a medium kind of question because to solve this again you really have to be good with facts you can't really guess which state has the numbers right 
so yeah this question you can risk it only if you have some idea if you are absolutely blank better to skip don't get into the risk of solving and getting the negative marks for yourself okay now that brings us to the question number uh, 39 question 39 was with respect to the green cover index what is green cover index and what it relates to that is very important question guys so talking about the green cover index green cover index was launched for a comprehensive pan india estimation of the green cover that we have on the national highways of india this index is talks about how much green cover we have in the national highways and this index is actually prepared by national remote sensing center which is which is uh, under isro and the national highway authority of india this itself says a lot about the green cover index it's a pan india talking about the uh, green the green the trees that we have around the national highways the green cover actually would be estimated for every 1 kilometer of the national highway it's an it's a it's a annual assessment that we take and uh, it actually help why this kind of surveys are done actually it it helps uh, you know make a comparison and ranking of the national various highways so that the in future when some particular highway gets the award for maintaining that green cover even other state authorities and other central authorities are inspired to maintain that green cover that is very uh, important point okay so remember that particular point guys interesting if somebody asks you about specifically if you have a question dedicatedly on uh, this uh, national remote sensing center remember its headquarters are in hyderabad it's an extra information you can keep it in your head so if you come back to the question what this green cover index can be so look at this green cover is it about evaluation of agriculture we don't really uh, go evaluate agriculture and call it green cover the word green cover is mostly with respect to the trees the the plantation the trees that we generally use so agriculture cannot be the right answer is it about conservation of the efforts in urban areas can be can be i can't say no yes it, this could have been the answer as well assessment of the forest cover in pro protected one so yes i can only eliminate one of course there was some confusion if you have to do the guesswork this could be really tough so in this particular scenario i would i would suggest you please take a very calculative risk if you know it because all the four, all the three are very very closely related but right now the answer we know the answer already it is the green cover of the national highway network in india so yes this question was definitely a tough one because uh, even the options are very confusing and because of the options being confusing it's difficult to eliminate in this kind of question so be careful sometimes the questions are not difficult the options are really difficult to eliminate that takes us to the last question question number 40 indus water treaty very famous treaty it is between india pakistan yes sir signed in september 1960 absolutely correct world bank is signatory yes because world bank is actually serve as a broker of this treaty so first and second are correct but as per the treaty it is pakistan enjoying 80 percent water rights india is left with only 20 percent water rights because as per the treaty if you look at the treaty uh, of the indus river 1960 treaty the uh, the indus river along with uh, your jhelum and chenab these three uh, rivers were assigned for pakistan's water use india has right over the uh, rivers like satluj bias and ravi so these three were given to india's use specifically so india has only 20 percent right on all the water the majority of the water goes to pakistan pakistan enjoying 80 percent of the water of indus water treaty okay remember this is absolutely important point so yeah here in this case we know the third statement is wrong so which statement is correct only two are the correct one because this treaty itself is very 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 famous it's it is well read treaty we all talk about it a lot of times and remember it was in news recently where 
our prime minister clearly gave a message to pakistan and said the blood and the water cannot run simultaneously if you keep sponsoring the terrorism in india you are not supposed to get the water the way you are getting so far it was a threat it was a reminder it was a warning it was a tough stand by the prime minister of india clear message to pakistan and that's why probably this question could have been a question in your upcoming prelims exam right so that is all from my side in this particular video i really hope you have enjoyed the second part see you guys very soon with the part number three till then stay tuned with pmf is and uh, best wishes for the upcoming exams so prepare well practice a lot of questions and get yourself in the exam mode upsc 2024 is waiting you could be the next is officer so all my best wishes guys how was the lecture how how was the discussion do let me in the comment section box and do not forget to like the video and share it with your friends see you with the part number three very very soon take care god bless you jai hind jai bhai